Father in heaven, we're so very blessed every day. Uh, here we have a beautiful day where your mercy, your grace, and your love was bestowed on us from the time we woke. We pray, Father, as we try to dig deeper into your word that we could get a glimpse of how great you are and how great salvation in Christ is. Uh, bless us, Lord, in this hour of instruction, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> All right. <laughs> We left off with, last time, the works of God are fourfold. Remember that? In our notes last week, we didn't quite finish. So I want to pick up where we left off. That God has an eternal plan by which He rendered certain everything actual and probable both in time and eternity. That takes me to the second, which we covered this last week, the decree. I'm just trying to pick up where we left off. In God's creation. <coughs> God, in the works of God, he, he, he decreed, had a plan for everything, and He created according to that plan, and He's going to work providentially according to that plan. I just want to, because there's a little bit, some discussion about all of that. just seemed like, wow, that's overwhelming. God's got everything. God is omniscient. These aren't in your notes. I've added a little extra here. I just want you to, some of this is not going to be in your book, because I added it. Just uh, trying to bridge from last week to this. God is omniscient. <clears throat> when I took the verse, his understanding has no limits. At the same time, God is unchanging. He does not change. So God has never learned anything. I think that's my next slide. Therefore, everything he knows is unchanging and certain. What God knows, he's always known. Now, <clears throat> God is eternal but by eternal it just doesn't mean he has a long duration of time he occupies eternity so that jesus can say before abraham was i am that is i exist back in the time of abraham right now he also exists in the future so god knows everything because he's there for everything all the time we are made of succession of moments okay okay for you i was born okay and then i one day through the succession of moments, I'm going to die. Boom. And that's in time. But all time is included in, in God. He created it. And so he occupies, because it's all inside of him. It says, in him we live and move and have our being, our very existence. So he knows the future because it's already certain to him because he knows his eternal plan and it's all planned out that way. This is mind-boggling. It makes us think a lot differently. I want to take Bible prophecy, for example. How many believe in biblical prophecy? You believe that you know, God predicted the future and it's going to come to pass. All right. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about Antichrist coming. They're going to, there's going to be false Christ coming in His name. Now, is that certain to happen? Yeah. And aren't these people opposed to God? So God rendered certain there would be people who's going to come in the future opposed to God. That blows my mind. Because someone asked the question, how about a guy like Hitler? Is Antichrist going to be worse than Hitler? Yes. Definitely. All right, definitely. And yet God planned for him, and we have a problem. That, did Hitler arise outside the knowledge of God? No way. So was it certain because of God knew it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, let me keep going. There's a thing called abomination of desolation. Anybody know what that is? That's when the Antichrist sets up a statue of himself in the temple in Jerusalem in the tribulation period. Just like Antiochus Epiphanes did uh, back in the 4th century of B.C. Okay? He's 4th uh, second, somewhere along there. And, uh, but that's recorded in the Bible as a prophecy to happen. Was it certain? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay? So God and His plan encompasses everything. Christ is coming in the clouds. Is that certain? Absolutely. Judgment of the nations. He's going to judge the nations. He's going to put all the goats are going to go into eternal punishment. Is that certain? Absolutely. Everything. Everything is in the plan. That's what I'm trying to say. Here, let's take Bible prophecy, for example. In Revelation 6, the fourth seal, one quarter of human population dies. Do you believe that's going to happen? Yeah. But wait, then we have a problem with the Holocaust. How can we have a problem with the Holocaust? One fourth of human population is going to die. Um, the sixth trumpet, a third of Earth's population is going to die. 
So if you only have three quarters left and you take a third from that, you only have a half of the world population. Half of all mankind is going to die in the tribulation period. Is that certain? Yes. Has God planned that? Yes. Yeah, it's in the Word of God. I mean, you, you can't thwart that. Well, <clears throat> plan it or does God just know it? Well, if he knows it, how did he know it? That's the question. Well, if he's been there, come back, he knows it. Well, he's, all, he's, he's everywhere at the same time. Right. Yeah. So, but the question is, plan Well, that's what we're going to get to. All right. <laughs> did he plan it? I mean, he's working everything after the council. Is <coughs> Did he yes. plan it? Yes. Yeah. If he didn't plan it, who did? He's the most high guy. See, all these doctrines of God, gotta, they got to intersect and interrelate and correlate. So if he says he's most high, there's no one above him, or nothing above him, then he's got to be the buck stops with him. All right? So if, if, if it happens, who is the planner of what happened? Either him or somebody say I had my chance, but chance, chance is a non-entity. It's a randomness. Randomness is a non-entity. So either God has an all-comprehensive plan because He's omniscient, all right, and that's that's He He's got everything. He knows everything. <coughs> <laughs> the next one I want to go to is uh, Revelation 20 verse 4. It says that they were beheaded for the testimony of uh, the Word of God in Jesus Christ. Is that in the plan? You mean there are people that are in the plan who are going to become righteous and then lose their heads, and it's all in the plan. You think it was in the plan for John the Baptist? If it was said, then it is. It is. It's in the plan. It's in the plan. That's, that's basically, because we have a tough, tough time. People say, oh, I can't believe that God would plan for Hurricane Florence. Well, yeah, he planned it. It's in the plan. It's the way he runs and operates this universe, this world of ours. You know, you got All, hey, Satan came up in, up to, in the book of Job. Satan came into the presence of God with the sons of God and said, oh, God said, how about my servant Job? Isn't he awesome? God brings him up. And Job says, oh, he only serves you because you bless him. You take everything away. He won't bless you. The devil said that. Satan said that. And he has to get permission to touch his life. Because Satan is not, and any plan that he has is not bigger than God's plan. God has tolerated Satan's plan so that in the end, every single thing is going to work together for good for the glory of God. Now, my mind is so finite, I can't get my head around that. But God exists in a whole different plane than we do. God is so much bigger, I cannot put him in my finite box. And so I accept what he says about himself is true. I think the same thing is true for everything. He makes everything work out according to his plan. That's Ephesians 1, 11, New Living Translation. I just kind of like that. He makes everything work out according to his plan. King James, he works all things after the counsel of his will. God has an eternal counsel. He's planned everything and he's working that out. Nothing happens in this whole universe that God somehow is not allowing to happen. So he's planned it to happen. He's allowing it to happen. And, and so that in the end, he's going to orchestrate it all together for good. All right. God's providence is the fact that the, ex the energy by which he created everything, that exercise of divine energy, he created a whole world. He used that same energy to continue to carry the world to its intended goal. So I can count on Revelation 20 and 21 actually coming to pass. There will be a place in heaven for me because he is actually running and carrying along this whole universe to its intended goal. <clears throat> That's why we have in Providence, God is working His plan to take everything to His intended goal, as in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. He doesn't just sit back and let them happen. He is running His universe, and He is in absolute control. I am so glad I have a sovereign God. All right. Now, I want to, this is where we're picking up. I think that's where we were last time. The fourth one was God's salvation. And during, including God's salvation, listen to this. This is mind-boggling. I think it's Peter's preaching. This man delivered up by the predetermined plan. God had a predetermined plan that Jesus was going to be crucified. And his foreknowledge. 
the foreknowledge of God. He said, that was God's plan. But you nailed him to the cross. In this one verse, we got the sovereignty of God, that it was the eternal plan of God that Jesus would be crucified. At the same time, they did it of their own free will. But it was in the eternal plan of God. Our free will is within the plan of God. Because God is just that much bigger than we are. We can't limit God to our finiteness. Let's talk about God's salvation. The working out of the divine plan as it relates to saving fallen sinners. This work includes choosing us to salvation. We already looked at some verses on that. We'll look at them again in the future. Providing a Savior. So God chose to save some out of fallen humanity. And then He provided the Savior, Jesus Christ. He sent the Holy Spirit to apply that salvation to repentant believers. Oh, I don't know. Did y'all get those? You, I think those are in your blanks. I think I'm on the page where you guys are at, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. <coughs> and these same things are going to keep popping up through every doctrine that we cover, every every one of these digging deeper. All right. We're going to we're going to run into this again when we leave the the one up here on God, go to the Son. All right. <coughs> Here's, a, here's a, why I'm saying it. He chose to save us. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. God, God chose me, chose you. If you're saying He chose you before time ever began. <clears throat> Listen to that, 2 Thessalonians. He says, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the setting part work of the Holy Spirit. He set you apart from the rest of humanity and through belief in the truth. He chose you to actually become a believer. Isn't that amazing? My salvation is because God's grace and grace alone, I didn't do anything to deserve it. Blows me away. Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. And I also appointed you to go forth and bear fruit, fruit that will last. In all verses, he chose us. In time, God provided salvation for God so loved the world that He gave. He said, His Son unto the world, the one whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We realize that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I got you. No, no, go ahead. All right. He provided salvation, but when the time had fully come, at the right moment, it was in the plan that at the right moment, God sent His Son, born under the woman, a born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. <clears throat> so God provided salvation according to the plan at the exact right time. And every now and then somebody will say to me when I'm sharing my faith, you know, it's too bad that Jesus wasn't born in our time. We could have videotaped him. We could have... <laughs> right? I wouldn't have to read it in the Bible. I could watch it on TV. <laughs> but the Bible saying it was the exact, precise, right time according to God's plan. He provided salvation. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his whole purpose, his whole mission was to save. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was the mission, to provide salvation for sinners. You might say that Jesus was born to die. He was born sinless, to bear our sin, to die for our sin. <clears throat> because he should not have died. Because the wages of sin is death. He should have lived forever. <clears throat> because he was sinless. But he bore our sin. He was born to bear our sin and die. It was applied. Salvation is applied. He, God applied salvation. It's all in God's plan. Jesus answered and said, I tell, him, tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh cannot give birth to flesh, <clears throat> but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So this being born twice is the application. The Holy Spirit applies. The Father chose. The Son provided. The Holy Spirit applies it to us. And just how should all of this make us feel that God is absolutely, totally in control and charge? Huh? Relief. Hopefully very humble. <laughs> I think I should have put relieved. I like that a lot better. If it were all up to us, would that would that make you feel relieved? No way. <laughs> I know. But it's all up to Him. That makes me just feel very humble that, you know, it's all of Him. I'm humble. And a little overwhelmed. God, this God. Sometimes <laughs> we were out at a bonfire the other night, and they pulled out a, the phone had the app. I think it's called Sky Gazing or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot it at the sky and it tells you all the stars. Yeah. 
And all of a sudden, you know, you, you were looking there, and you look out at all the stars. And then you think for a moment, out of this entire universe, God cares about me. I am like a speck of sand. He chose me. He saved me. It's just such an overwhelming, humbling thing that He did that for me. It just blows me away. I mean, it just, just, just very, very cool. All right, that was the end of last week's lesson. <clears throat> okay, now I've got to show you my lesson. And I got a page more notes this week than I had last week. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> All right. We like questions, but that sure does delay us. And, uh, and we'll just bump it back one more. Hey, digging deeper into the sun is our next topic. This study will have two parts. The first part is the person of Christ, who Jesus is. The second part is the work of Christ, what Jesus did. And we're probably more familiar with this doctrine of the Bible than any other doctrine. That's because we're a church. And the church is built by Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And so we're going to probably know more about this one than any of the other doctrines that we cover. All right. So let's talk about Jesus' as person, who he is. First thing is he is pre-existed. He existed before creation. Jesus existed before. Not the man, but the person we call the God. He existed before creation. The second person of the Trinity existed prior to coming into <clears throat> this world, prior to the Incarnation. He existed before that first Christmas. He did. When Jesus was born, the person already existed. The body was taken up. Okay. So let's look at some pre-existing texts. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come... <clears throat> for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So let's get the text here. <clears throat> Bethlehem, Ephrathah, okay? You're small among the clans, but out of you will come one who is from old. The word is olam. Olam is the word for eternity. You have come from out of eternity. This person, even in the Old Testament, saying, <clears throat> the word ancient times is eternity. You've come from old, come from eternity. So the one that is predicting is going to come is the eternal one. That's very interesting. Very interesting. In John 1, we covered this several times, but repetition is the mother of all learning. So let's, let's repeat our, myself again. In the beginning was the Word. In the very beginning. <clears throat> it's interesting that the Bible uh, in Genesis chapter 1 has in beginning. It doesn't have the as we have in our New Testament, or, or as we have in our Bibles. Uh, bear sheep in beginning. <coughs> and the idea is whatever beginning you set, there's no beginning before that. The beginning of all beginnings, that's when God created. So time begins with creation. There's no time before that. You're in eternity. <coughs> Here we have in the beginning, whenever the beginning took place, the word was, past tense, already was, the, in the beginning was the word. He already pre existed. He existed before when time began. And the Word was with God. You've got the word, 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 several times. This word, the Lagos, it's all capitalized because it's a personal name. The second person of eternal trinity is here called the Word. And he was with God and he was God. We call that the Lagos, the Lagos, the Word. <clears throat> John 8, 8 says, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, before Abraham... Okay, let's put Abraham on there. Abraham lived at about 2500 B.C. So let's go before Abraham. Jesus said, I am. Present tense. I exist before I was born. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, so he existed before Abraham existed. 2500 years before Jesus, the body, uh, Jesus already existed. <clears throat> Remember we talked about the Tetragrammaton last time? The I am that I am. When Jesus said I am, he is invoking I am. I, 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 I'm the self-existent God. I am who I said I am. I am who I am. He said I am has sent me to you. That's what the Hebrew said. And here he said, I am. I'm the I am. So I existed before I had my physical body. <clears throat> he had a pre-existent activities. He did things before 
He took on the incarnation, took on a body. He had eternal fellowship with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We've got this word with. <clears throat> this word with, He was with God in the beginning. So we got the Lagos. And we got God the Father. All right? And He was with, pros. Now, pros comes from the, the longer version. This is a preposition, and we believe it's built off of the word prosopon. Prosopon means your face. So to be with somebody is to be face to face with somebody. Okay? Face to face. So it's suggesting here that the, the Father and the Son were face to face, although they're spirit beings, so it's not like they have faces, but the, the, he's communicating to us that there was a personal relationship of fellowship and a pre existent activity of God. They fellowship with one another. All right? The next one is he had pre-existing activity of glory with the Father. He says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before the world began. Before the world ever began, Jesus is saying, I, the Lagos, had glory with the Father. So there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they glorified each other. Holy smokes, this is pretty cool. <clears throat> he was before the creation of all things, because it says, through him all things were made. Without him was not anything made that has been made. And uh, so the, the, he is the agent of creation. He created it all. <clears throat> Pardon? We just went, we wondered about number two. <laughs> What's number two? I, I don't have a number. He is, uh, is it glory? We weren't sure if it was glory. Or... Oh, number two, I think I'm coming up on that one. Yeah, yeah, oh, we're not there. Yeah, we're not there. And we're still under preservation of all things. He upholds all things by the word of his power. <clears throat> yeah, we're still under number one. He's upholding all, it's Jesus that is upholding all things. Colossians says, in him all things exist. Jesus holding it all together. Did you ever, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but none of us has ever seen an atom, right? But in an atom, there's what? What's going around the, the atom? Electrons. Electrons. What's on the inside? Nucleus, proton. Neutron, proton, okay. What's in between that? Air. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that held together? Gravity. The Bible says <clears throat> Jesus. Jesus. He, it's in him. All things consist. He's holding this whole thing together. He's, he's holding this whole thing together. It just blows my mind. All right? He upholds all things by the word of his power. You really realize we're just surveying this because we can drill down on every single one of these a lot deeper. This is okay. He had special appearances in the Old Testament. He had special appearances in the Old Testament. For example, Moses was told to hit the rock. Now the rock came water. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 says, They drank from, this, from the spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. Somehow, the second person, eternal trinity, manifested himself in the form of a rock. They smoked the rock, and out came the water. This is called a Christophany, because we know that that theophany was actually Christ, because the New Testament tells us. Remember the burning bush? God manifested himself in a flame of fire. We call that a theophany. We don't, it could have been a Christophany. Maybe it was Christ in there speaking to him. I don't know. I know for sure that that rock was Christ because the New Testament tells me that rock was Christ. You see? So Christ was pre-existent. He appeared in the Old Testament. He is God. Number two. two. All right. There, there we go. This is demonstrated by the fact that he is called God. He is called God. He has God's characteristics. I think these are all filled out for you, right? He does the work of God. All right, he's called God. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He just simply called God. Lagos, equaling the Word. The Lagos here says the Word was God. Lagos equals God. So to say Jesus is the Word is to say that the Word is God is to say Jesus is God. This is really my body. <clears throat> After the resurrection of Christ, Jesus appears to Thomas, and Thomas says, My my Lord and my God. God. And he's not rebuked for that. He's accepted by Jesus to be venerated as God. All right? 
In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, but, you, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. The speaker, according to this passage, is God. And God is saying to the Son, your throne, O God. So God is calling Jesus God. Because right? they're both God. They're the same God. He is called God in Titus. While we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God. The antecedent here is the Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who it is. While we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God, who is Jesus, the Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he has characteristics of God. All right, I think we have blanks to fill in. And I, I, I'm not going to pull up all these verses. We've, we've covered several of them before. Eternality, okay? He was eternally with God. Before Abraham was, I am. He's got eternality, omniscience. John 1.48, it says, No one needed to testify to him the, uh, about man because he knew what was in man. He, he knows what's in us, all right? And so he's got an omniscience about him, omnipresence. Now it says in Matthew 28, 20, uh, where it says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's an omnipresence about him. Omnipotence, Revelation 1, 8, tells us that he is omnipotent. He's all, got all powerful. And he's immutable, Hebrews 13, 8, where he says that uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he shares characteristics or attributes of God. All right. I'll wait till you get all those filled in. Anybody need more time? Yeah. All right. Oh, that's what last week. You can look all these up later. Yeah, that's this week. That, uh, yeah. Are you guys all caught up? Well, it kind of went off. It's over here. Yeah. Your notes have two. Your notes Oh, my notes, yeah. I know that. I, my notes are a little bit. Messed up I'm not, here. I'm not worried about it. No. Let's keep rolling. Right. He has God's characteristics. I got a few there. Holiness, goodness, love, etc. Everything that can said be about God the Father that we covered last week, you can find somewhere in the New Testament that it attributes the same thing to God the Son. That's what I, I mean, I, we just go on making a huge list. He's got mercy. He's got pity. He, you, you name it. A grace. You just go... All of them, the, the, the whole list of them are, are the same because Jesus is God. <coughs> now, he does the work of God. He creates. We know that from John 1, 3. Without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 16, created all, in him all things consist. Um, he also upholds the creation. How are we, we already covered that? Hebrews 1, 3. He raises the dead. All right? Nobody but God can raise the dead. He raises the dead. He forgives sin. In fact, Mark 2, that's a big issue. Jesus said, oh, your sins be forgiven you. And they said, whoa, 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 you can't say that. Only God can forgive sins. And he said, well, what is easier to say? Your sins be forgiven you or take up your bed and walk. He takes up his bed and walks. And, and so he said, I demonstrate, that's what miracles are. They're, they're a sign to the message that Jesus is giving to validate the message. So they're revelatory design saying, this is the truth. Listen to this, guys. And he forgives sins, which only God can do. Now, he is human. We've established he is God. Now I'm going to talk about his humanity. Right? Jesus is identified as perfect humanity. He is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 45. I'm sorry, 15, 45. <clears throat> so that all that can be said of true humanity, except for sin. Now, I've listed verses here. These are really interesting. 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says he knew no sin. He was not acquainted with personal sin. 1 Peter 2.21 he, he was without blemish. He did no sin. 1 John 1.3.5 oh, really? He doesn't have sin. And all of these verses say he has So, Jesus has all of true humanity, like the original Adam before he fell into sin. So he's called the second Adam. He's the second or the last Adam. The first Adam was perfect humanity without sin. You know, people sometimes say, oh, well, I'm only human. When they mess up, it's the wrong answer. It should be, I'm only sinful. <laughs> because he was perfect as he was made as human. And it wasn't humanity that made him fall, okay? Christ is perfect humanity. And 
he does not sin. So to say, oh, I'm only human, what I really want you should be saying is I'm only fallen human. <laughs> and so we know what a person says, so we don't go jumping all over his throat and say, oh, that's wrong. Uh, we just accept that and move on. But theologically, we need to know those differences. He is human, therefore he had a human birth. Romans 1, 3, Galatians 4, 4. Fullness of time, he was born, born of a woman. Okay. He had a human body. Uh, Hebrews 2.14, he didn't give him uh, angels. He wasn't made of the nature of an angel, but he gave, us, gave him a human body. All these verses talk about his human body. <clears throat> he matured. I love this. Luke chapter 2.52. And Jesus uh, matured in his stature with men and his knowledge. You know, okay, remember that? Mm -hmm. i got to ask you a question. So Jesus is there in Joseph Carpenter shop. He's just a young guy. And, and uh, <clears throat> Joseph uh, says, hey, I want you to nail that in while I nail this in. And Jesus uses the hammer. You think perhaps he might have missed the nail and hit his thumb? No, he was perfect. No, but he was also human. <laughs> he was human. He was human. <laughs> How many think that he might have slipped off and hit his thumb? All right. How many think, no, he couldn't have done that? Well, of course, he was human. He was maturing. <laughs> Part of our maturing process is growing. You think when baby Jesus decided to walk on the first day, he got up and walked? You think maybe he crawled? Did he, when he tried to walk, he fell over to the side? Like, of course, that's huge. That, that, that's, there's nothing sinful about maturing. Okay? And so there's nothing wrong with you know, when you, you trip. Okay? That, that's part of human, my human frailty. It's, it's kind of like, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up in a minute, being hungry and thirsting and all that. Jesus had a human soul. John 12, 27 says he's got a human soul. Immaterial part. He's got a human spirit, according to Mark 2, 8. He's got a human spirit. All right? So, let's move on. He had human limitation. Oh, we already got to that. He hungered. <coughs> So, you know, after the service day, if he had been here today, you know, his body, he would have said, hey, let's get something to eat. Count me in on the dinner. <laughs> you know? He might have picked and choose, looked around, and said, you know, what's kosher and not kosher? <laughs> okay? Just, I don't know. But he ate. He was hungry. Okay? He thirsted. That's what he told a woman as well. I thirst. I thirst. It's because it's a human condition. All right? He grew tired. That's in body. This, this just blows my mind. Because here's God. We're going to see in a minute. He joined the human nature with him. That he is experiencing being tired, which he, by nature, he's omnipotent. He never diminishes in power. But through the, the union with our humanity, he's able to experience from our perspective what it's like to be flesh. Isn't that amazing? All right. He slept. The Old Testament says God never sleeps, nor does he slumber. So the divine person is... I don't wear whatever you going on, but given Jesus, it's sound to see. Sound to see. All right. He had human names. Son of man. I'm going to go through these quickly. Son of David. He's got to write fast. Son of Abraham. He's just called man. He's called Jesus. Jesus is the New Testament form of Joshua in the Old Testament. Do you know how many Joshuas were probably running around in Jesus' day? He wasn't the only Jesus. Remember on Easter we went over how there was Jesus of our uh, Barabbas? You know, because some of the manuscripts actually have that Barabbas' first name was actually Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. These, these are all human names given to Jesus. Now, he is the God-man. That's what I'm wanting to get to. We establish he's God. He is man. And now I want to talk about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. There is a single, indivisible person. He is one person. Just one person. Who is God, and there are two permanently united natures. United but distinct natures. A divine nature and a human nature. And I don't know how to wrap our minds around this whole idea, but I've used this. Did everybody get those words? Indivisible in nature? Okay. Uh, I got one person. I put that in yellow. I don't know what color people's person is. <laughs> but uh, some people's persons are really colorful, I guess. But 
Here's just one person. This is the Lagos, okay? Think of that, the Lagos. He's the word, the one person. He has a divine nature. I didn't put it on top of it because we lose the fact that that is now, I put the blue there, okay? The blue for his, blue is heavenly divine. He's a divi That's his divine nature. Although God is not a circle. I mean, God is omnipresent everywhere. So I don't know how to do this. So that's his divine nature, one person. <coughs> But not only does he have a divine nature, I had to divide that in half, he has a human nature that's been joined, but they're distinct in the one person. So the one eternal Son, God, Jesus, the Lagos, has a divine nature. He's God, omniscient, omnipotent, he's human, he's got a body, he's tired, he's weak, all of those things. And they're united, but they're not commingled. They're two separate units. But inseparable because Jesus is forever incarnate now. And that, that, this, is, this is what the, the Bible is teaching. So I put it this way. And now I got them to overlap. The person, you know, the yellow is made this kind of a brownish and this kind of a greenish. Divine nature, human nature, one. One person, Lagos, he is what we call the God man. The God man. I never reverse those terms. I don't say he's a man who's become God. He's the God-man, the God who became man. And so we have in this one person, two natures. All right. The union exists in such a way that the property of the two natures <coughs> are neither transferred nor changed in any way. He is one person, the God-man. As the scriptures say, well, you might need, did you get all that? No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've got this reduced to a couple slides. There are volumes of this. <laughs> volumes. Because this is the heart of Christianity, who Jesus is and what he did. There's volumes of this. All right. The Word, <laughs> Lagos, okay, the Word. The Word became flesh. That's the whole event of uh, the Incarnation, our Christmas Advent story. And he made his dwelling among us. The word for dwelling is tabernacle or tent. In the Old Testament, Moses put up the tabernacle, the tent. God came down, right? And he filled that. He's saying in the person of this, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, God came down and he tented. He was in that body. We have seen his glory. Remember the glory cloud? Well, Jesus had a glory. And it's interesting, John chapter 2, this is John chapter 1, uh, John chapter 2 says, the disciples glorified him. They glorified him. Uh, the glory of the one and only, that's the only begotten Son, and uh, who came from the Father. Everything's this, he came from the Father, and he's full of grace and truth. So, uh, then he's going to put that in opposition to Moses. Moses gave us the law, but we receive grace and truth from the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not take another person. There's only one person. There's not a divine person and a human person. Jesus was not schizophrenic. <laughs> Jesus didn't talk to himself. Uh, hey, it's me, uh, the divine Jesus, telling you, the human Jesus. Oh, uh, yeah, what do you want? Uh, that was not going on. It was the one person, the Lagos, okay, the eternal person, who now operates in two natures, not just one nature. For all eternity before time, he operated just in the divine nature. But with the incarnation, he now operates, the person operates in two natures. So he experiences everything that God does, and at the other time, uh, he experiences everything that man does. This is just mind-boggling to me. I don't know about you guys. To me, too. Yeah, apparently. Huh? At the same time. Isn't that what at the same time. You can be a both at the same time. Wow. That blows my mind. Yeah. Therefore, the divine person, the Lagos, is the single person of the human nature as well as the person of the divine nature. And that's all I'm trying to say. There's not two different persons, two different natures. And uh, this is one of the earliest doctrines nailed down by the early church was, who is this Jesus? The next one I want to go to is, so how did this incarnation take place? It's called the virgin birth. 
Actually, it's not the virgin birth. She was a virgin when he was born, but it was the virgin conception that is miraculous. He was born naturally, like everybody else, but it was his conception that was supernatural. Within the Virgin Mary's womb was conceived supernaturally the sinless human nature that, uh, and all that pertains to the humanity of Christ. So God the Holy Spirit, we'll see, is the one who is behind all of that. Both Matthew and Luke affirm that the conception was through the agency of the Holy Spirit. I probably don't have to tell you too much about this. We celebrate it every Christmas, don't we? Yep. We, we read the stories, the narrative of how the Holy Spirit announced that that which was in her was going to be the power of the Most High and all of that. We, we read that from these passages every year. And we will do so again this year, no doubt. Not only did the Holy Spirit produce the conception, but he also protected the embryo until birth so that Jesus was born sinless. He was sinless. The virgin birth kept the Lord from the pollutions of a sinful nature, which is so important. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all sin. And the reference there, the theologians will tell you that, that all sin is my original sin was in Adam. When Adam sinned, the entire human race, which meant every, everyone that was produced out of him, was contaminated with that pollution of sin. It's like leaven. Once the leaven gets in, it permeates the whole. All of humanity is sinful. So when I was born, I got that sinful batch from Adam. The seed, you know, was passed on to me, and so I was sinful. The Holy Spirit protected that embryo by a divine intervention <clears throat> of having a woman conceive without the seed of the man. That's the miracle of Christmas. Isn't that amazing? Does that say women are sinless? No. No. Not at all. That would say the men. The men had the seed. The men had the seed. That carried the sin. That carries the sin. Exactly. So, now some people say, well, maybe it was a freak of nature that she just had two eggs that somehow merged together. You know what else, You know what would happen? Would have had a daughter. There wouldn't be X and Y chromosomes. It'd just be the one guy. So it would have been a daughter. So it's, it's miraculous. It's totally miraculous what the Bible is telling us to happen. Okay? <clears throat> Therefore, he is sinless and he is a suitable Savior. That's because he has no sin. That one, that, see, he qualifies to be my Savior. I can't pay for your sins because i got to pay for mine. I mean, if I'm going to pay for yours, who's going to pay for mine? And so I needed someone who was sinless, and that's what this is all about. What if one thing had you, oh, well, this is my discussion question. I didn't realize I got one in here. <laughs> no time. This is our break time, first break time. All right, how are we doing so far? Everybody need, you want to stand up, stretch or anything? We need to go. All right, here's my question. What if anything have you learned today about Jesus that you did not know before? Just anything. You say, well, I just, just didn't know that. More important. Yeah, yeah. I know. I don't know that I know it. But the I don't concept write of the human and God gets and the idea that say, I'm God and I never get tired of it. Yeah. That, that, that blows my mind. He's a human. He has Well, he knows everything. And yet, as a human, operating as human nature, he says, no one knows the time of the coming except the Father himself. Because that's in his humanity. But in his deity, he knows everything. So he operates between the two. Very, very interesting. Yes, but he knows. Bye-bye. It's crazy to think, I mean, like you said, he tattled around and fell over and had to go through puberty and do yes. all the human things. Did, did, he, did, the, did they ever fight? Did they ever conflict? Did the human nature say, hey, you know, I want to go and get drunk with the boys over here. <laughs> and then the divine nature says, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you're, you're right. I think Jesus drank. I don't think he was ever drunk. I don't okay. think so. He drank wine. He drank wine. That was the day of the time. That's the really Yeah. He might have had beer, too, because we found that, you know, the... The recipe for beer is far back as the Akkadian culture, which is the time of Abraham. Well, that was Even part of the their Egyptian. diet. Yeah. The Egyptians drank beer. Yeah, yeah the, the, the recipe's really been around because for because water yeah. <clears throat> so scarce. But the whole idea that, that Jesus matured 
just like you and me. And it's, it is mind boggling there. Yeah. Yeah, he stumbled, he fell, you know, he played with the kids. Now, Jesus had siblings after his birth. Mary had other children. I would not have wanted to have been one of the siblings. Right. Because <laughs> right. Mary and Joseph are sinful parents just like you and I. Say, How come you can't live up to Jesus? Would you please look at you. Why don't you just do what Jesus says? Why do you keep getting it? You, well, that, that sibling. What would had, Jesus do? <laughs> what would Jesus do? <laughs> just say to you, come on, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so going through like that, this is constant yeah. conflict between yeah. good and evil, Star Wars, and, you yes. and you've got Jesus yeah. who's you know, coming from the good side, and you've got the devil who's with that, you've got that going on around you know, Adam and Eve and stuff, but now you've got Jesus who gives up his deity, I don't know, maybe kind of, to become man, who now forever will be this commingled United but not commingled. They're, 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 they're together, but they're, his natures are separated from each other. One person in two natures. It's the one person. Yeah, I understand. That in and of itself is kind of mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. Uh, I'm trying to think of a theologian. He's got a good volume just on that whole thing. The, the promise, I think, of Revelation is that this will become a new earth. A whole new earth. A whole new world. New, new heaven and new earth. Right. Um, and we're all going to be there with Jesus. Yes. That means Jesus is going to be here with us. Yes. Uh, or wherever there is, it's not. So it's kind of like he gave something up to do this. Well, yeah. I mean, it's the thing going on in my head. I think in, in Philippians it says he, he laid his glory aside. Mm -hmm. He didn't leave any attributes aside because if you leave your characteristics beside, then you're not who you are because you are the sum total of all your characteristics. So. He didn't lay any of his attributes aside, but he laid the glory aside. I think that's pretty clear from Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8 there. That he, he laid them aside so that he says, Father, glorify me with the glory I had from the beginning. Because as human, he wasn't, artists like to put a halo around Jesus, you know, he's walking. So you know which one is Jesus, he's got the halo. <laughs> Jesus didn't have a halo, there was no glory, no effulgence like that. He took on a body just like ours without sin. So I don't believe his body got sick. Because part of sickness is part of the curse of the fall. So I don't think Jesus had a sick day in his life. Isn't that amazing? You know, my mom never had the flu, but she had a lot of other things. <laughs> but so, but Jesus, and we could go on and on all day with this, isn't this? I mean, this talk about Jesus, it's just mind-boggling. I'm kind of piquing your interest, I'm glad. For you. And, and I can direct you to some more things if you want to read them. All right? I want to turn now to the work of Christ, the remainder of our time. And the work of Christ... <clears throat> We look at the person of Christ, now we're going to look at the work of Christ, and it falls into three categories. These are my subjective three categories. All right. You read other theologians, they got a lot more categories, but I try to try to summarize this whole work in the three areas. The first one is Jesus is a prophet. He's a prophet. That should be one of your blanks. I didn't know how to put a line underlying the word prophet here, because who's going up and down? Is and well a prophet is, is a prophet is someone we described this before? receives a message from God, and then passes that message on. That's what a prophet is. So Jesus is a prophet. We're going to look at that in a moment. Jesus is also a priest. The work of a priest is to take mankind, mediate, and take them to God. That's the work of a priest. And so that's your second fill in the blank there. He's, he's a priest. The third work that Jesus does is a kingly work. Jesus is king. So we call him prophet, priest, and king. The only other person I know of in the Bible that three, holds three offices, because these are offices, prophet, priest, and king. They do three distinct works. The only other person in the whole Bible I know of that has three offices is Samuel. Samuel is prophet, he's priest, and he's a judge. Okay? And so, very interesting. There's only two that I'm aware of in the whole Bible that have three different roles of what they do, three different jobs, three different assignments. Melchizedek was a king priest. Yes, he had two. Yeah, he was not a prophet. But uh, here's the only one, the only two that I'm aware of. Yes. <coughs> now, <clears throat> I want to discuss his priestly work. We'll start there, okay? And that's the whole idea that he takes people to God. What is a priest? 
Every high priest is selected among men. You got to be a you got to be a human being to be a priest of a hum humanity. You've got to be taken from men, and is appointed to represent them. So he is a representative. He represents man to God. Anytime somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, will you pray for me?" and you say, "Okay," and you pray for them, you are doing the function of a priest. You are taking that person, their request, to God. That's a, that's a priestly function. That's what you do. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a lot more involved in that because the sacrifice of Christ hasn't taken place yet. But there's, it says the next thing it's going to say is, and to offer sacrifices for sin. He represents the matters related to God, and he offers <coughs> gifts and sacrifices. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to offer a sacrifice, you, you, you couldn't do it yourself once the Levitical law was put in place. You took your sacrifice and you laid your hand on it. There's a, there's a seven-part ritual that they went through. And, but ultimately, it was the priest who put it on the altar and made the offering of your sacrifice. In the New Testament, we give our bodies a living sacrifice, like we talked about in the message this morning. I give my body a living sacrifice. That's, that's my priestly work. I do a priestly service. I offer, offer up sacrifices. <clears throat> the sacrifice that Jesus offered up was a substitute, just like the lamb in the Old Testament. The guy brought his lamb, they sacrificed the lamb, they put it on the altar, they burned it up. That lamb was a sacrifice that was a substitute. They laid their hand on the head of it before it was sacrificed, symbolically transferring my guilt to the lamb. And when the <coughs> lamb was slaughtered and its blood collected, sprinkled around the basin of the, the altar uh, so that without the shedding of blood there's no mention of sins the Bible says the blood is sprinkled they burn the carcass on it as a fragrance up to God that justice is all being satisfied when I transfer that over what I'm really saying I lay my hand and I'm saying I'm the guilty party this substitute symbolically is representing taking my place because we know in the Old Testament according to Hebrews the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin they were just a shadow of what needed to come, a foreshadowing, until Jesus said, I'm the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. But that's what a priest does. So Christ himself died. I mean, I'm sorry, Christ also did not take upon himself the glory, uh, glory of becoming a priest. And he, he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now it's already been mentioned, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a king, underlined, so you need to fill that one in. Melchizedek is a order of priesthood that predated the Levitical priesthood that Moses gave in Exodus. So back in Genesis chapter 10, where you have this guy Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem, of Salem, <coughs> Abraham pays ties to this king because this king is also a priest. He's a king priest. As a king priest, he <coughs> rules in the city there in Jerusalem. As a priest, he takes sacrifices unto God. And he receives the offering from Abraham after Abraham had great victory in battle. But he takes Abraham's <coughs> gifts before God. What did, uh, what, <coughs> what did Jesus do as a priest? And John says, as he sees the Lamb of God coming, he said, look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, boom, he wipes it out. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and his mission was to take away the sin of the world. So he is the offering. So it says in Hebrews 9, 26, but now he has appeared, okay, Jesus has appeared, once for all at the end of the age. So here he is at the end of the age. Um, from the author's perspective, we've gone through these ages. You can go down all through the ages of the Old Testament. And he says, now he has appeared at the end, once for all, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. So as a priest, he's offering a sacrifice, but at the same time, the sacrifice he is offering is himself, because he is the Lamb of God. He's not offering uh, a lamb or a bull or a goat or anything. He's offering his own body. Jesus is both the priest and the sacrifice. We believer priests also have, and my priestly work is to offer a sacrifice. One of them we talked about this morning. 
I offer myself a living sacrifice. So I am the sacrifice that I offer to God. I say, God, here I am. It's me. I'm giving myself up to you. Hebrews 9, 26 says, Now he appeared once for all at the end of the age to do away with sacrifice for himself. Just as man is destined once to die, and after that to face the judgment. How did he do it? We're still working on this. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sin of many people, and he will appear a second time to bear, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. He appeared a long time ago to take away the sin of many people. That's right. There's so many verses on this. Jesus is a substitute. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned, uh, has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him. God put on him the sin of us all. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's substitution. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 2, 24, he in himself bore our sins on the, on the tree, in his body on the tree, that we might, be, we might die to sin and live for righteousness. I memorize these in different translations, so I'm messing them up when I read. I'm sorry about that. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ died for sin once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Why did he do it? The answer to that is because the death demanded it. The wages of sin is death. And so he took my sin, paid my price, so that I might go free. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love to us. Why did he do it? I did it out of love. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Who pair? In behalf of. He did it in behalf of me. He took my place. Substitute. Everywhere is substitution. And I can compare other places. Galatians 1, 4, 2, 20. It's, he dies for our sins. He died for us. For our sins is what he died for. So what did he accomplish? Now, one theologian has 33 different things that Jesus accomplished on the day he died. 33 things. I boil them down to three. They all fall under one of these three categories in my opinion. The first one is he redeemed. Redemption. <clears throat> you know, in the last study that we did, I put up an S and H green stamp. Remember that? <laughs> the Redemption Center. Redemption means to pay, pay, you're buying, purchasing. We make most of our purchases today with a little plastic card, Master, Visa, or something like that. It's all electronic transfer stuff, but uh, you know that's the medium of exchange. Some of us still use the old old stuff, you know, the Williams. I'm not, uh, I don't know them well enough to call them bills. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, some pay with cash, that's the medium of exchange. The medium of exchange to pay the debt is redemption. I'm purchasing something, paying the debt. I'm buying. He paid a ransom. So I want to look at some verses on the ransom. All right? In Matthew 20, 28, Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. So what is a ransom? A ransom is the price demand, demanded to free a hostage. So if Christ paid the ransom for us, then I was a hostage. I was taken captive, a hostage. There's no ransom note. All right. So the question is going to become, uh, let's just continue. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So what captured me? I was a slave to sin. Sin is my hostage. I'm hostage to sin. Sin has a price, death, okay? So who is the hostage? My old self. That's what he says, my old self. He's talking to Christians. He's saying, you know, your old self, before you became a Christian, you were a hostage to sin. Who holds us hostage? Well, the answer to that is sin. Sin holds us hostage. But with the crucifixion of Christ, it does away with all that. Because the price that Christ pays, pays the debt to buy us back to himself from our sin. First Peter says this, 
For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. It wasn't silver and gold. You can't, you can't buy your redemption with money or with your credit card. He says here, For you, you know that it was not through those perishable things, <coughs> from your empty way of life handed down, from, down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. The medium of exchange to buy back your soul, your salvation, was the blood of a blemishless, without defect, sacrifice, and the only one that qualified to be that is Jesus, all the way back through the incarnation that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, so she did not conceive with any sin. So, then we have a sinless Savior who can pay the price for us and buy us back. It says in Ephesians 1, 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according in accordance with the, the riches of God's grace. Here's the big picture. We were, uh, we were slaves to sin. And we were held hostage to sin. And we were on like the auction block. We were slaves. We were on the auction block. The price tag on us was death. Christ paid the price of death by being a substitute for us and raising from the dead so that He, by paying that price, freed us from our sin and has now enslaved us to Himself. We belong to Him because He paid the price. He owns us. And that is to be a slave to righteousness. I am to live for Him. Isn't this a beautiful picture? This is what's going on in, in the big picture of this, this salvation. All right? Just give me a minute to get all those words down. Probably not human nature talking about here, but... I had a resistance to the idea of being a soul leading to righteousness. Well, see, that's from our American perspective. The Bible never says slavery is wrong. Paul says, I am a slave of the, I, I'm an apostle slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Slavery in the Bible is a good thing. Because you, when a, when a, a master purchased a slave, he was making an investment. If I'm going to get a good return on that, but take good care of my, my investment. He was only a slave for so long because the year of Jubilee, they were all set free. But a man could say, oh, I love my master. My master takes good care of me. I want to be a slave for life. And so he bore a hole in his ear. You guys wearing earrings. I'm always thinking about that when I see You see these earrings, it means I'm your slave forever. So I don't know who bore those holes in your ears, but good thing we're not under that law. Huh? But, but... See, we, we've experienced the American culture where there were evil masters. And the Bible has a concept of slavery that promotes good masters. And if it's a bad guy, you get, you get out from under. say, I don't want to see you ever again. Okay, there's this, this thing. And you can sell yourself into slavery to pay debts. And then you work that off. We basically do the same thing. I, I take a loan from the bank. And uh, I put up my house and everything I have as collateral. If I fail on that, they take it all away from me. Uh, this was very similar, but it was in a society that didn't have banking institutions and all of that. And so um, when the Bible's talking about being a slave and a slave to righteousness, it's talking about very positive experience. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. No, it's very, very, we got a cultural thing going on in our culture versus the, the Bible culture. All right. <clears throat> the next thing that he did, he paid the ransom uh, of his redemption. Atonement. He satisfies justice. Satisfies justice. That's what he did. The Old, Old Testament word for atonement. He atoned for our sins. You'll hear that re reference. The Old Testament word atonement means cover. And so I got the Ark of the Covenant here. And it comes from the Old Testament where it, use, it is used for the lid this lid on the Ark of the Covenant. That lid is called the atonement cover, at, at least in the New International Version. Above the Ark were the cherubim of glory. So Moses beat out, had beat out two golden cherub, uh, cherubim over it. And the lid on that is called overshadowing the atonement cover. Inside, they call it atonement cover because that's where this thing took place, what they call atonement. He writes on, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now, basically. He says, you guys aren't ready for what i got to teach you. Okay? 
you should be progressing in your Christian faith. You should be growing, but you, you don't you don't have any substance. Can I divert just for a moment because of that phrase? I read an article this morning. Um, it's on Fox's uh, website. Fox News website. It's uh, it's by uh, Andy Stan. Okay, he's a preacher down in Atlanta, Georgia. What's the last name? Stanley. Stanley. Andy Stanley, why are young people not going to church? It is an excellent article, and what he basically says, what he basically says, we're just not teaching the answers to the hard questions. That's my boiling it down. We are not teaching. We're trying to make everything so culturally relevant yeah. and make it so they just want the hard core answers. And when we don't have them, we don't train our kids to have those answers. They leave high school, they go to college, they got all these college professors, who then start asking the hardcore questions, and they don't have the answers, they abandon faith. That's what he's talking about here. We can't discuss these things in detail now because you're just not ready for the deep stuff. Amazing. All right. I'm just talking about the cover. That cover is called the Atonement Cover. All right. Inside. The uh, Ark of the Covenant was the law, the Ten Commandments. There was Aaron's rod that budded and pot of man, okay, originally. But the Ten Commandments. In another place, right here on the cover, once a year, Leviticus, Leviticus 16, the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holy Chambers carrying the blood, and he would sprinkle blood on, it's called the mercy seat, King James, or the atonement cover here, he would sprinkle that blood on there, and that blood would make an atonement. That's where we get the word. Atonement for sins. Here's the deal. This is the throne of God. We'll see that in a minute. God manifested himself in effulgence or radiance of glory. Inside, above the atonement cover there, there's this effulgence of light and glory. God was manifesting through a theophany that he was there. Here's his law. This tent is sitting in the center of his people. His people are nothing but a bunch of sinners like us. How does a sinful people approach a holy God? They have broken these Ten Commandments over and over, constantly, every day. Covetousness, adultery, lying, stealing, all those things are going on among the people. How can that unholy people approach a holy God who's broken his law and if he's just, he's got to destroy every single one of them because they're all sinners, right? And the answer is they brought in the blood of a sacrificial victim who represents innocence. He takes it in. He sprinkles it on that mercy seat, that atonement cover. And that blood, the Lord looked down from his throne and said, Oh, the blood has covered the broken law for one year. And that was to go on until the day the Lamb of God, which came into the world, to not cover, but to take away the sin of the world. And that's what Jesus did. He took it away. The only way they could approach a holy God was a blood offering. And they took their blood in it. That satisfied God's justice. He said, for one year. So next year, you better do this all over again. You bring that in one year. And he's saying, but the blood of bulls and goats could never really satisfy it. That's called a shadow of the reality, according to the book of Hebrews. You know, you've got a shadow. When I walk in the right place, the light is shining, you see my shadow. That means a reality exists. Hebrews calls all of this a shadow of the reality. The reality is Jesus. Jesus takes away the sin of the world. This is just a shadow, a covering that God says, okay, I accept that, that you believe in that, you're trusting in me to do what I told you, and it'll satisfy for a year until the ultimate is taken away. So the atonement cover has to do with satisfying the justice of God. The ark was the throne of God who dwelt in the midst of his people. I just told you that. They were brought back the ark of the covenant to the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubs. So I got tried to get a little bit of radiant of light in there. The New Testament atonement which is referred to the lid, signifies that God's righteous demands for justice have been satisfied. And so, why? Because Christ's sacrifice does more than just cover sins, it takes away. I'm repeating myself. I said all this. I'm a little ahead of my slides here. Sorry about that. <clears throat> 1 
1 John 2, 1 says this, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Get that? He's the mercy seat, the lid where they sprinkle the blood. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. He's met all the demands of a holy God for my sin to be paid. And not only for ours also, but for the sins of the whole world. His, his purchase price was paid is a penal price so that he paid the penalty it covers all who, who fall under that he has paid the price in full oh this is beautiful stuff <clears throat> therefore Christ sacrificed himself satisfies the just demands for sin as Paul says in this verse God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement in Romans 3 25 through faith in his blood so I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ actually paid in full the price of my sin he did this to demonstrate his justice. The soul that sins should surely die. But Jesus was took my sin, so he died. He's got an, he's an eternal person, so he satisfies my justice. Because of his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Down through the ages, all the way up to Christ. Just put a covering. Just cover it up. Cover it up. But it never got rid of it. But at the end of the age, he said... I just for I was forbearing all of that down through the ages. He did it so he might demonstrate how just he is at the present time. And so to be just and the justifier of those who have faith in him. He was just in what he did in punishing Jesus for my sin. So he justifies me, declares me to be righteous because Jesus' righteousness was imputed to me. This is, I know, heavy theology, but it's good stuff. This is good stuff. This is stuff we need to know. He demonstrated his justice. Demonstrated his justice. He justifies those who have faith. He satisfies justice. That's what the cross does. In Hebrews, it says this. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way. He had to be humanity, not an angel. Uh, so he couldn't be an angel. And that's what the argument there in Hebrews is. He's been talking about angels prior to this in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest, that's his priestly work, in service to God, that he might make an atonement, so he had to become a faithful high priest, so that he had to become humanity, so that he might go to the cross and make an atonement for the sins of his people. He atoned for us. All these, all these passages teach us. What did he accomplish? Third thing, he reconciled. He reconciled. The word reconciliation means to make peace. <clears throat> Restoration means to restore to the condition that it previously existed. Reconciliation means to make peace. That's all it means. In Colossians, it says this in 121. Once you were alienated from God, okay, and you were enemies. So I got this guy here. He's running away from God. He's an enemy of God. He's had nothing to do with you. He says, you're in enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by the physical, by Christ's physical body through the death <clears throat> to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. In Romans 5.10 it says, for when we were enemies, <coughs> I got, you know, here's God, here I am, and we're having this clash, we're having this war. He said, when we were enemies, we were reconciled, we were made at peace. How is it? We were God's enemies made peace? <coughs> See you. <laughs> oh, she has some place to go. <laughs> she warned me earlier. All right. I think that's what that was about. <laughs> right. <laughs> How much more, having been reconciled to God, shall we be saved through His life? Reconciliation is all part of salvation. If I get reckon, I got to be at peace with God. That's all part of the salvation process. According to this, it precedes it so much more. Having been reconciled with God, shall we, I said, how, much, how much more shall we be saved through this life? Not only this so, but not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. We're at peace with God. That's all part of our salvation. I'm at peace with God. I'm not an enemy of God. God is not out to get me. He's not throwing lightning bolts down from heaven. Sure, he disciplines me as a son, but he is not judging me. He is not judging me. 
For, listen, for he himself, that is Christ, is our peace, who has made the, talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, one. And he's done this in one body to reconcile both in the church. And uh, that's through the, the cross by which uh, <clears throat> you put to death their hostility. It's all about the church, but Christ is our peace. He's the one who's reconciled them. He has made the peace. That's what reconciliation is all about. He is a living priest, is my next category. He arose bodily from the dead. Not too long ago, there were some theologians who were arguing that Christ did not raise the bodily from the dead, but he just rose uh, spiritually from the dead. But we have problems with that. He said, I received what I passed on to you. First importance that Christ died for our sins, was according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day. All according to the scripture. He died for my sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. Uh, look at my hands and my feet. Touch me! And see, a ghost, a phantom, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, they sh he showed him his hands and his feet. They could touch and handle him. He raised physically, bodily. It was a physical, bodily resurrection. So Jesus is my heavenly priest. First Corinthians said he was seen by 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still... Uh, still living, some have fallen asleep, some have died. There were eyewitnesses to the fact that he was resurrected. He is a living high priest. He is a living high priest in Acts. He says he raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep him. He was raised from the dead. He's alive everywhere in the scriptures. Uh, he was raised for our justification, Romans 4.25. He also is a heavenly priest in that he ascended into heaven. I don't know if you saw that. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Watch that. Yep, he ascended into heaven. All right. He ascended into heaven. And we see that in Acts 1 9. This is the story where the two men stood there in shine, white and shining apparel and said, Why are you, men of Galilee, looking up into heaven? Did I that, Mark? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back again in the same way. He was taken up their very eyes into the clouds. That's exactly what happened. Hebrews says, therefore, since we have this great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we have professed. He has gone through the heavens. He's in the third heaven of God right now. Somebody's going to ask me where that is. And I'm going to tell you I don't know. I don't know. It says the third heaven? There's a third heaven. Mm -hmm. Our air and our atmosphere, the universe, then the third heaven where God is. Oh, I didn't know where the first two. Hebrews 2.14, uh, 2, uh, I get my verses wrong here, but <clears throat> because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. It says, therefore, he's able to save completely those who come through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He, he, those who come to God through him. He is my meteor, he's my priest, he takes me to God, he's living, he's alive, and he intercedes. Jesus prays for me. Jesus prays for you. He's my mediator. I put it this way. This is my paraphrase. Jesus makes sense out of the nonsense I pray. <laughs> yeah, he fixes it, tweaks it a little bit, passes it up to the Father. Yeah. After he provided purification for sin, died on the cross, Went into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Uh, that's a circumlocution. He's talking around majesty in heaven, saying he sits right next to God the Father. Powerful. <laughs> he is a coming priest, king. He will return from heaven a second time. Second time. So Christ sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time. Not to bear sins, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. He's going to come a second time to the earth. And that's exactly what Acts 1.29. Why are you looking up into heaven? The same Jesus has taken up from you. It's going to come back in the same way you've seen him go. Jesus is coming back. How many here would like to do a study on that? Second coming? Yeah. Yeah. End times, all of that? Yeah. 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 We'll have to do that sometime. Juicy, crazy. How many have read the book of Revelation? How many have read the book of Daniel? Oh, good. Some of you read through the whole Bible, so you can say, yeah, I read them all. Yeah, I read them all. All right. It's been all day. Do you want to 
Oh, the genealogy is mostly fascinating, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> in my father's house are many rooms. You've heard this verse at funerals. Almost every funeral has it. But we're not so I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come back. Before Arnold said this, I'll be back. <laughs> Jesus said it. I'll be back. And take you to be with me. Jesus is coming back. Now, the next part of this, I guess how much time we got. We, we're going to hold it to the full amount of time. <laughs> so we have to sit in another week. week. So. What did you say? I got one more week, yeah, but next no, week. No, no, no. I said, but you can have to in another week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we will focus on uh, Jesus as a prophet and Jesus as a king. All right? And I don't know that we get it done in the next 10 minutes. But in the book of Acts, chapter 3, he says, Repent then and turn to God. That your sins might be wiped out and the time of refreshing may come. The Lord might return. And that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you. Even Jesus, he must remain in heaven until the time comes. For God to restore everything as he has promised long ago through the holy prophets. There's more with prophets. Oh, I did this backwards. Let's see if it'll work. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like to me. Like me. That was Moses. That goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. There was a prophet. Uh, Moses prophesied there would be a prophet that would be raised up like him, which is the Messiah. From among your own people, you must listen to everything he says to you. <clears throat> the point is, Acts applies the prophet, the words, of the prophetic word of Moses, predicting a future coming messianic prophet, like Moses, he applies it to Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy that there would be a, another prophet come that would be raised up like him. This passage is calling Jesus the prophet. The prophet predicted in the Old Testament. So we know he's a prophet. Jesus is a prophet. All right? His prophetic ministry is foretelling. We see that everywhere. Preaching. He's got the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he was preaching. He also has a foretelling ministry of predicting. He predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection. We'll see that in just a moment. Okay? This has his ministry of predicting. <clears throat> his preaching ministry concerned the gospel. In Luke 4 16, we spoke of this just a couple weeks ago. On the Sabbath day, Jesus went into the synagogue, as it was his custom, he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He rolled it and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has appointed me to preach the good news, the gospel, <clears throat> to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Preaching, proclaiming, both words are preach, actually in the Greek New Testament. It's proclaiming the good news, the gospel. That was His prophetic ministry. He was preaching, going about foretelling, telling what God had given him to say. He then rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. The eyes of everyone on the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He is the gospel preacher of Isaiah's prophecy. He is the preacher. The, the, not only is he the prophet of Moses, he's the preacher of Isaiah. His preaching was concerning the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. In Matthew 4, 17, it states, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, <clears throat> for the kingdom of heaven is near. <clears throat> so he's preaching about the kingdom. He first says, Repent. That's turn around. You're going the wrong way. He says, Because the kingdom of heaven, the one that God is going to establish upon the earth, millennial kingdom, is near. The kingdom is near. That was his preaching. Therefore, he preached the good news of the gospel, that the kingdom of the, <clears throat> the coming kingdom of God, which is, I believe, the millennial kingdom, was eminent. It was right at hand. Why? Why was it eminent? Because the king was present. Jesus is the king. He's present. The kingdom powers were present. He was doing the miracles, all the things. He was healing. He was giving sight to blind. And he was doing all those things. The powers of the kingdom were present. But... The subjects were not present. The people are going to say, no, we won't have this man to rule over us. They rejected him. They rejected him. But he was preaching 
as a, as a prophet. And most of the prophets were killed by the religious people of the day. And Jesus said, I've got to die at Jerusalem because that's the way it goes down. I want to turn our attention to his prophetic predictive ministry, not just his preaching, <clears throat> you know, foretelling and telling what God wants of our lives, but now predictive. He's going to predict things to happen. The first one is his own death, burial, and resurrection is predictive. I can choose several of these because he did it several times at several different occasions. I got this one. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples, he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and then he must be killed and on the third day be raised. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He was predicting his death, burial, and resurrection. He predicted, you know, last week uh, we, we looked at Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. He even predicted the method he was going to die. He's going to be lifted up. Okay? And he was, that was a prophetic predictive ministry. He predicted the formation of the church. There was no church at the time of Jesus. In the Old Testament, there's no church. He says to Peter, I tell you that you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will, future tense, build my church. It did not already exist. The church is something different between the Jews and the Gentiles. We'll see that in just a moment. It was his purpose was to create himself one new man, making the two one. So we got two here, the Jews and the Gentiles. From Abraham down, if you're a descendant of Abraham, he was a Hebrew. They were later called Jews. He came out of the Gentiles, but was separate entity. Everybody else is a Gentile. But he says he created in himself one new man. People get saved out of the Jewish community. Paul was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. Okay. And then people get saved out of the Gentile community. Luke was a Jew. Timothy, I mean, was a Gentile. Luke was a Tim. Timothy were Gentiles. These people are, and it makes one new entity in the church. And so it says uh, another place, give none offense, neither to the Jew nor to the Gentile nor to the church of God. Three different entities. He created himself. Jesus predicted that this would happen, that there would be a church. He also predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD. Some of his disciples remarked about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for you, or as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. So let's say he prophesied this at a year about 31, 32. In the year 70 AD, almost 40 years later, Titus the general destroys the whole Jerusalem complex, temple complex. So there's not a stone left on top of another stone on the, on the temple mount. And it's still not there to this day. What you see here, the time will come when it will not one stone will be left on another. Every one of the stones will be thrown down. He predicted the tribulation and second coming. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us what they said. <clears throat> when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceive you. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? All right. Let's see. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You'll hear wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pain. This translation is translating that we're birth pain, tribulation. This is the beginning of tribulation. I think it's a period of time. It's going to last seven years. It's prior to the, the millennium. And the church is raptured before it. For seven years, there's these terrible birth pangs on the earth. I, all those other features I'm adding from different other places in the Bible. I want to turn our attention to Jesus as king. All right? How are we doing? Time is up. Keep going. Keep going. How many of your favorite? Keep going. Only one more page. Okay. <laughs> Next line is Jesus is king. Jesus is standing before Pilate. 
And Jesus answered to Pilate and said, Are you the Christ? And he said, You are right in saying, or Are you the king of the Jews? And he said, You are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born. And for this, I came into the world. <clears throat> Jesus was born king. All you have to do is go to Luke chapter 1, verse 31, 32, 33 here, and you'll find uh, you will be a child, give birth to a son, and you, you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. You're going to sit on the throne of David. And he will reign. You're going to reign over the house of Jacob. You're going to have a subject. And his kingdom, you're, you're going to have a kingdom. Don't you have no end. So you have a throne and you have a kingdom. You're a king. You're born a king. He was born a king. When the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, they said, Where is he who has been born king? Well, they're following the star. We saw a star, came to worship him. He was born a king. Jesus preached that the kingdom was at hand. Watch. After the 40 days of temptation of Christ, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent. Turn. See, we, we, we are showed this slide. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Oh, it's near. The kingdom of heaven is about to come. It's near. I believe this is the millennial kingdom. It lasts for a thousand years. It says it's, it's near. Some translations have, instead of near, it's at hand. It's imminent. It's about to happen. So where is the kingdom? That's what he's preaching. Multiple times I've said that. Where is the kingdom? Where is it? Jesus' kingdom was rejected. And John 1.11 it says, He came to that which his own, and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. He came. Oh. He came. I got him coming here. <laughs> He's riding in. <laughs> he came to his own. And his own did not receive him. They said, no way. Instead, what did they do? A week later. Not even a week later. Five days later. They crucified him. We will not have this man to reign over us. The official presentation of Jesus as king was the triumphal entry, which I really think is the triumphal tragedy. He rides in on the donkey. Remember that? I don't know if I have that slide up here from uh, Zechariah 9.9. He's riding on the donkey, presenting himself to be the king. On Palm Sunday took place to fulfill what was just spoken uh, through the prophet, saying to the daughters of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's actually from Zechariah 9.9, quoted in Matthew, uh, applying that prophecy to that date that their king, <clears throat> your king, I don't know if I have that highlighted or not yet, your king comes to you riding on a donkey. He, that was the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ as their king, but they rejected their king that night. Well, See, what I, happened? Hmm? What happened if they not rejected their king? This is a good question. All right. What would have happened because... Uh, the kingdom would have been... First of all... The kingdom, well, there are certain other prophecies that have to be fulfilled. So, there was a prophecy that there would be a time of Jacob's trouble, which is the tribulation period. So, this is what I think would have happened. He still had to be crucified, right? Jesus had to be crucified. It was predicted, Isaiah 53. So, I am surmising what God's plan B might have been, but he had an eternal plan, and this is what was to be the plan. But let's just suppose that uh, they had said, hey, we'll accept you as king. The Romans would accuse him of insurrection, arising of rebellion, and the Romans would have crucified him. What? That was their means of execution, not the Jews. They would have crucified him. He would have buried, rose again the third day. He would have ascended into heaven. There would have immediately came the seven-year tribulation. All those things you read about in the Revelation. All those things had to be. Those that they were ordained. And that, as soon as that seven years was over, Jesus would have returned, and he would have set up his kingdom. There would have been the judgment of the nations. He would have set up the kingdom. The sheep would have gone into the kingdom. The goats would have gone into, uh, they would have been judged. And there would have been a thousand year reign. They would have uh, the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. You know what's missing there? The church. The church. The church was not seen in the Old Testament. Jesus said, I will build my church. And so, he said, the word church just means my assembly of people. My assembly of people. We are in the church age, which is where he's assembling from both Jews and Gentile people. They said, well, wait, if you predicted that, where would that have been if there was no church age? It would have been in the tribulation. If you read Revelation chapter 7, there's 144,000 Jews and an innumerable company of Gentiles that are taken out to become his people. Okay, so 
that's a hypothetical what if, but that never happened because it wasn't in the plan. The plan was for it to be this way. They rejected the Jew, Jesus, on the triumphal entry, and then on that Friday, five days later, they're crucifying their king. And remember they had that placard put up above, the king of the Jews. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat. Here's your king. I hope I got that. Yeah. Here's your king. Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? I hope I got that. I got that. Yeah. And Pilate said, we, <clears throat> Pilate asked, and they said, we have no king but Caesar. They rejected him. So they handed him over to be crucified. Jesus predicted, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who produce the fruit of it. They were not repent. That was the message. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is that. Repent. Repent. And the leadership the le in Jerusalem and the majority of the people, they did not repent. So the kingdom was taken away and it's going to be given to a people who produce the fruit of it. The phrase taken away from you is in future tense. It will be taken away from you. And it will be given to a future generation of Jews who have produced the fruit that characterized the kingdom, namely repentance. In Zechariah, I think it's 12, it says when Christ returns, they are going to look on him whom they have pierced. And the idea of look there, theologians have said for, for a long time, that, that look means they're going to look with the eye of faith. Just like they looked on the serpent in the wilderness, they're going to look to Christ when he returns with an eye of repentance, and God is going to then establish the kingdom for a thousand years. That's still future. It hasn't happened. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Meanwhile, Jesus is building a new, new people. In between that rejection and his second coming, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. <clears throat> still future during the life of Christ. Jesus, when he said this, there was no church. It was still future. Therefore, it did not exist in the Old Testament. There was no church in the Old Testament. The church began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We discussed that last Pentecost Sunday. We went over that. I could rehearse it again if you want. The church will end at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. I should have put those passages on it. 1552, 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, uh, 4, 17. Then the repentant Jews, I don't know why that yellow is in there, will arise. Okay? And it's only after the, the church is gone that there will be a repentant Jewish community that turns to Jesus and nationally, uh, as it says in, I believe, Romans chapter 11, the nation's converted in a day. So Israel will be converted in a day. Yes. When Christ returns in all of his glory, they're going to look at him when they pierce. God's going to regenerate all their hearts. There's going to be a, a Jewish community that believes in Jesus as their Savior. And he sets up the kingdom. And those go into the kingdom with them for a thousand years. Yeah. Jews for Jesus. Well, we have Jews today for Jesus, but they're part of the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're believers in Jesus as a church age. Mm -hmm. But this is going to happen as a nation, national event in the future. And Ezekiel 37 refers to it as uh, dead bones being raised again, the nation. <coughs> Matthew 24, 44. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour you do not expect him to come. I don't even know where I'm at in the notes. Jesus returns as king. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Isn't that great? Now, Jesus' kingdom is going to last for a thousand years. Revelation 21, 4, they came to life and reigned with him a thousand years. Actually, in that passage, six times it mentions it's 1,000 years. <coughs> and sometimes people say, well, that's just a large number. means a long time. Well, if that's not a large number, because in chapter, I think it's 16, it speaks of an army of 100 million million. It's a lot more bigger. So it doesn't mean just a large number. There's larger numbers in that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Jesus is going to offer up the kingdom of the Father. Once the kingdom is done, he's delivering it up to the Father. Then the end will come when he will hand over the kingdom of God to the Father, to God the Father, after he destroys all dominion, all authority, all power, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And then he's going to deliver of this kingdom to the Father. And we're going to have uh, an establishment of the eternal day, new heavens, new earth, heaven forever and ever. And uh, God reigns. And our prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, is going to happen. 
We won't do great now. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Conclusion. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. All right. Sorry, we're about ten minutes over. I, I reached to the end there. <laughs> Next time, we're going to talk about digging deeper into God's Spirit. God's Spirit next week. And we'll have covered the Bible, the foundation of what we believe. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Alright? I'm laying a foundation for something in the future, but it's about the future. But you've got to have a handle on some of what, who God is, who we are, to see what God's doing through the ages. Cool. See you next week. It's our last week.